Pourquoi Parce Pourquoi Ils ont mis le, la non. taxi. Non. Ah non, mais ça, c'est bête, c'est pas possible.
Yes, now. So good afternoon and sorry for uh, being late again. Uh, welcome to this press conference for uh, following the Foreign Affairs Council today. The HRVP will brief you uh, about the outcome of today's uh, meeting and then uh, we have time for a few questions. High Representative, you have the floor. Thank you, Marila. Thank you to all of you. Uh, today has been an it has been an intense meeting, as, as always, and we took an important number of decisions, not only discussing and, and analyzing, but also deciding. An important decisions which uh, underpin the European Union resolve on supporting Ukraine. Supporting Ukraine against Russia's aggression, defending peace and stability in the South Caucasus, and standing for human rights in Iran. This could be a good summary. Underpinning our resolve on supporting Ukraine, advancing peace and stability in the South Caucasus, another concrete decision, and standing for human rights in Iran. We had uh, the opportunity of exchanging with uh, Minister Dimitro Kuleva, who addressed the Council by video conference uh, from a bomb shelter. I think it is the first time that we discuss with a minister that communicates with us from a bomb shelter, while Russia was continuing uh, its strikes on Kyiv. And I want to say clearly, support in Ukraine remains our first priority. Today, the first priority of the European Union foreign policy, of the European Union short, without foreign policy, is to support Ukraine facing this brutal invasion. Putin is losing. Putin is losing politically and morally in spite of that, he continues the escalation, including indiscriminated attacks on civilian targets across the whole Ukraine, as we have seen this morning. We also uh, took note of the vote at UNGA last week. This, this vote confirmed the international isolation of Russia but we cannot take it for granted, and we need to stay the course based on our triple strategy, supporting Ukraine, pressuring Russia, and addressing the wider fallout of the war, because this war is affecting the whole world. I said about uh, concrete decisions, let me precise about these concrete decisions that we took today in order to support Ukraine. First, we agreed on establishing an European Union military assistance mission to support the Ukrainian armed forces that will be happening in European Union soil. The training will take place in the European Union soil, and the mission has a purpose. It's to train around 15,000 troops to start with, maybe more, but the first objective is to train 15,000 troops. Uh, with the added value of doing that, all member states together. Additionally, to the activities that many of them are already doing on their side. Second, we also agreed uh, to allocate uh, another 500 million euros from the European Peace Facility to finance deliveries to the Ukrainian defense, defense forces. Uh, as you know, this brings the military assistance of the European Union through this intergovernmental fund. I want to stress it's not part of the European Union budget. Approved by the Parliament is a site, is a fund decided by the member states together and managed by them it, it amounts to 3.1 billion euros. But once again, this is the point of the iceberg. There are much more 
coming from the member states. We continue discovering mass atrocities and reports about systematic kidnapping of children from Ukraine by Russian forces. If confirmed, this would amount to another war crime, and the fight against impunity must be strengthened. We have already discussed about how to do it. Out from Ukraine, the ministers also uh, green-lighted the deployment of a monitors from the European Union in Georgia, the Georgia mission, to Armenia, to the Armenian side of the border with Azerbaijan. A team is already there, and according with the green light of the Council, we will deploy 40 monitors on the Armenian side of the international border of Azerbaijan in the next weeks. In the next weeks, very quickly. I am really proud of how quickly we have managed the creation and deployment of this mission. And our presence in the conflict in the Caucasus between these two countries is a significant signal of the uh, European Union readiness to support the stability in the South Caucasus. This has been based on the demand from the partners. And as I said, the team is already on the ground in Armenia, and the deployment will be very quick. Then about Iran. In Iran also, we have taken decisions. From uh, yesterday night, we are following the situation in Evin prison very closely. I personally convey my concerns and expectations to the Foreign Minister Abdullah in the hours following the fire in order to ensure the safety of the inmates, all inmates, but also including some European, could I say, political prisoners. We are certainly appalled by the still unsplained killing of Masha Amini, by the brutal crackdown of security forces against protesters who continue to die or being detained in the hands of the security forces. All ministers express their strong concern about these facts and this situation. The latest reports the Council has been studying coming from NGOs state that over 100 people have died. According with this fact, and according with the proposal of several member states studied by the ambassadors, the Council adopted today restrictive measures against 11 individuals and four entities, targeting those linked to the death of Masha Amini and to the repression of peaceful protesters. And if needed, we are ready to add more names to this list. I want to use this opportunity to call on the Iranian government to immediately end the violence, to release uh, those detained and to allow normal internet services and flow of information. The issue of the use of drones by Russia, allegedly supplied by Iran in the war in Ukraine, has been also considered by the ministers. And certainly, Minister Kuleba, during his speech to the ministers, and strongly expressed <coughs> his concern, and he denounced the use of this kind of arms. <coughs> we are following very closely this use of drones. We are gathering evidence, ev evidence, and we will be ready to react with the tools at our disposal. As I said, we are advancing in gathering evidence. Another big point in our agenda were our relation with China. We reconfirmed the validity of the multifaceted approach that you know, a partner with whom we must engage, a tough competitor, more and more tough, and a systemic rival. 
the, the council studied a, a report presented by the external action service and there is a full support among member states <coughs> to continue engaging on issue of interest for us the most important one is climate change but not the only one avoiding to turn dependencies into vulnerabilities now we are talking about our dependency of vulnerability from the Russian gas, we have to avoid to create new ones. And we need to strengthen our resilience. We have to increase our internal resilience and working with our partners. The debate on China will continue, but it was symbolic that uh, today, just uh, one day after the speech uh, of President Xi and on the eve of the European Union Council discussing about our China relations, the Council received the first report taking into account the messages sent by President Xi on his speech. On Bosnia and Herzegovina, we discussed the last uh, elections the elections were competitive and well organized, overall according with the reports of the OCE, ODIR, but they were also marked by quite a strong mistrust in public institutions. The final result has still to be certified. There are allegations of uh, widespread electoral fraud have triggered a recount of ballots to the Republic as president's race. And this recounting will take place. But we need to keep Bosnia Herzegovina on the European Union path. That's why the European Commission recommended last week to grant the candidate the status to Bosnia Herzegovina on the understanding that a certain number of steps are taken. And with that, we pass a clear message to the border Segovina authorities. First, they must be swiftly setting up at all levels, both the government and legislative authorities. And secondly, they have focused on delivering reforms. This is a matter of absolute Priority. There is a window of opportunity, a new push for the process of border Segovina towards the European Union, and this occasion has to be seized by the politically responsible authorities of the country. We remain extremely concerned about the socioeconomic situation in Lebanon, the inability of the political forces to proceed with uh, much needed reforms. We call on Lebanese authorities to elect a new president before the end of the month, and we welcome the agreement between Lebanon and Israel on the delineation of their maritime borders. In this uh, moment, in this troubled world, this is certainly a good news. And last but uh, not least, we discuss uh, about the situation in Ethiopia knowing that the situation on the ground has never been that bad, both on military and humanitarian fronts. We reiterate our belief that there is no military solution. The only solution is a political one. We call for a cessation of hostilities. We call for the withdrawal of Eritrean forces. We call for an immediate and unimpended humanitarian access to Tigray. We call for accountability for human rights and international law violations. We call for the government of Ethiopia and Tigrayan leaders to put in practice and to turn in concrete actions the invitation sent by the African Union to start peace talks. The long process of mediation has to continue, and we are supporting it in close coordination with international partners. But unhappily, we have to recognize that this mediation process, by the time being, has not delivered enough. We need this mediation process to be more 
proactive and deliver more and for that these long announced talks has to start and be translated in concrete actions opening to humanitarian access the front line in Tigray and asking for ceasefire withdrawal of Eritrean forces and accountability for human rights violations. This is uh, my resume of uh, this very profitable meeting with a strong agreement among member states on a common evaluation of the situation in the different issues and adopting uh, quickly uh, this uh, set of uh, measures. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we have, uh, we proceed to your questions. And Christian, you have the first question. Uh, oui. I'm going to ask the question. I was going to, to, to answer the question in <laughs> Spanish to be sure that they master well the language. Tu, tu peux poser en, en espagnol ta question si tu veux. Christian. Je vais pas oser, non. <laughs> C'est pas une langue de travail, je suis well, désolé. It's monsieur. not one of my working languages, I'm afraid. Bon. C'est pour um, le privé d'Espagne. Uh, en fait, j'aurais deux questions à vous poser. Not, not je sais que vous les avez abordées lors de votre point de presse, uh, during, mais M. Kouleba a demandé à l'Union européenne, lors de son intervention, un neuvième paquet de sanctions. Et il a demandé également à ce que les sanctions soient prises contre l'Iran pour la fourniture des drones. Alors, où est-ce qu'on en est sur ce neuvième paquet de sanctions Je sais que vous êtes toujours en train de d'élaborer, mais on sait qu'on est arrivé pratiquement au point. Je ne sais pas très bien qu'est-ce qu'on pourrait ajouter comme sanction. Euh, en revanche, sur euh, les drones iraniens, je n'arrive pas à comprendre quelles preuves vous avez encore besoin de trouver. Et ces drones sont stylés, signés iraniens. Qu'est-ce que vous avez besoin encore comme preuves La deuxième question euh, est un peu plus légère et euh, je me demande si vous avez été bien compris lors de votre intervention à Bruges. Vous avez comparé l'Union européenne à un jardin et le reste du monde à une jungle. Ce qui, dans l'entendement de tout le monde, est compréhensible, sauf pour un certain nombre qui vous ont accusé d'être le ténor ou le héros des néoconservatistes, euh, des néoconservateurs américains, voire un raciste. Euh, voir vous ont conseillé de prendre votre retraite. Alors, vous voulez savoir, est-ce que vous avez le sentiment d'avoir fauté Est-ce que vous avez le sentiment d'avoir été mal compris Et dans ce cas-là, euh, merci. Vous pouvez peut-être éclairer un peu de lumière Avec beaucoup de plaisir. Merci. Je vais vous parler de Well, thank you for your question. Regarding Minister Kuleba's interventions and what he said on sanctions, well, he welcomed the new package of sanctions package. He obviously encouraged us, called upon us to maintain and continue pressure, economic pressure on Russia. He also explained to us how the authorities uh, view Russia's uh, use of, in their view, uh, Iranian manufactured uh, drones that are being used by the Russians. Some of those have been shot down by the anti-aircraft. Now, on the sanctions specifically, we've only a, a few days ago approved a new set of sanctions. It's an ongoing process, though, when it comes to sanctions. We can, we're continuing our work. It's work in progress when it comes to sanctions. Now, on work in progress, I can't give you details of what any putative new sanctions might entail, because we're working on these things. However, we're always thinking about different ways, about other ways in which we can make life difficult for Putin in terms of funding his war effort, and uh, we're looking at ways of building materials to that end. There will be sanctions as and when we identify the sort of targets we can aim at. On drones more specifically, well, you know that these processes have to be based on uh, evidence. Evidence exists. It has been provided by the relevant uh, intelligence services, including Ukrainian intelligence services, other member states 
of Council have also called for evidence to be uh, got together in a coordinated and comprehensive way. Iran categorically denies and has to me, the minister categorically denied to me personally that there were any drones that had been sent uh, to be used in the war in Ukraine. However, member states have asked us to go forward to collect evidence, all the available evidence, and on that basis work will continue as appropriate. There was nothing specific on the agenda today, so we couldn't take decisions on this. However, the work is ongoing. Ukraine is absolutely convinced uh, that th they are uh, under this sort of attack and will continue to provide us with evidence to that end. On the other question you raised, perhaps I could say a little bit more in answer to it. Let me see. For a long time now, I've been saying that, that in my view, since the Second World War, the EU, the European adventure, was what led us to be able to build what I called, in all modesty, the best combination of political freedom, economic progress, and economic well-being, and social cohesion. These three things together have made Europe a place where citizens have the advantage of living in an organized society built around those three pillars. And these are not three EG things to find across our world. You may have political uh, uh, freedom and economic progress, not social cohesion. There are other countries where they e progress economically, but they don't have political freedoms. Unfortunately, there are some places in the world where they don't have economic progress or well-being or stability on a political sense or freedom. Now, I'm not saying there aren't other countries countries like Canada, Australia, I could go on with a long, long list, where we have very similar models and outcomes. But, quite frankly, I believe firmly that these three aspects in combination make Europe what it is, where a lot of people live and where a lot of people would like to be able to live. Now, I may not have always expressed this properly. And what I was trying to say to the students in Bruges in this particular case was that they should not believe that the, in other parts of the world, the rest of the world, not all over the rest of the world, but in other parts of the world, you can't take this well-being uh, for granted. There are places in the country where they don't have the freedom or the well-being or not enough economic or social cohesion. That they had to be aware that they shouldn't believe that this, what we had in Europe, was available everywhere else. And that you have to have this commitment going forward, including to the rest of the world. Now, we can't build walls around Europe and isolate ourselves. We cannot be an island uh, in the world away from what's going on elsewhere. It was a message against Fortress Europe about let's close ourselves in and keep the others out. I was speaking to young students and asking them to make a commitment, a bit like my generation did in all modesty, as I did when I was younger, a commitment to the rest of the world that we ha have values to transmit and what they mean, the, the freedoms, uh, 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 and what we've achieved are there to be shared because we are in competition with other models, other political models. There is a risk, there is a threat. Europe is under threat, I've said it before. The war in Ukraine, the war against Ukraine just shows that and what those threats can be. I do not understand the interpretation that has been given to what I said. I certainly do not uh, share the allegation this is somehow imperialist, uh, uh, wh uh, white supremacist, uh, or a retrograde message. Far from it. It was meant as a message of solidarity, speaking to young Europeans, telling them that they have this good fortune. I say this to my grandchildren. 
They are so lucky to live where they do, in this free, organized world built around economic well-being and social solidarity. But this in turn brings an obligation towards the rest of the world. As Europeans, we have to step up to the plate and commit more. That is the guarantee for the survival of our own model. I am therefore disappointed to hear some of the interpretations that have been uh, uh, bandied around. I reject them totally. I, I think everything I've done in my life c completely uh, goes against being called a neocon or anything of that ilk. Thank you, uh, Shandor from Euronews Hungary. My question is regarding Hungary. So uh, this government of Viktor Orban just started a massive anti-EU sanctions uh, campaign. They even put a big billboard of, which says a big bomb called sanctions. Uh, this is dropped on us by the EU. How do you see this campaign and how do you see you know, the, the latest Hungarian uh, position of having a constructive abstention uh, with regard to the Ukrainian training mission? So keeping Hungary on board and having this position, is it a success or a failure for the EU's uh, foreign policy lines? Thank you. I am convinced that the sanctions against the Russian economy work and will work ever better. Today we got the latest reform on the effect of those sanctions. Look, I'm not going to draw more analogies because then everything gets misinterpreted. So, I'll hold my piece here, but yes, sanctions don't trigger an impact overnight. They take time, but they start to bite, and they do bite. It's a, a mistake to think that sanctions were an error. However, I respect everyone's opinion. All I can say is that Hungary so far has voted in favor of all the sanctions or has not opposed them. And now, again, through constructive abstention, they have allowed the, uh, the, the military training mission to go forward. Now, what I can say is what happens when there's a vote and a decision to be taken. Hungary has never impeded or prevented that decision from going forward, whatever that decision was at the time. Now I will turn to colleagues uh, who are connected uh, remotely, and uh, I give the floor to Rosie. Thank you very much. Rosie Burchard for Future Story News. Hi, Representative, on China, did any member states ask for a redesignation of China away from the 2019 three-pronged approach, particularly perhaps with regards to the uh, classification as a rival? And what do you think an expected third term of presidency means for EU-China relations? Will they get worse? Thank you very much. We need a microphone for the speaker. Microphone. No, 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 ha habido ninguna objeción. There was no objection of substance to the text we had tabled. As you know, there's the threefold description of the state of play. Perhaps what I s would say is that the competition aspect. I mean, you have a partner, competitor, rival. That's the three triptych I mentioned. Now, the central one is c competitor, and maybe that one has become more central, if you see what I mean in today's discussion. The, the message from China now is one of competing, competing on a political level, their uh, economic success, their desire to have influence at all sorts of levels, their presence in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America and elsewhere. That's the first discussion point we had. We analyzed President Xi's um, speech, which is a very uh, strong statement about their desire to have influence across the world. 
The Chinese Communist Party has taken a decision. It's not up to us to discuss that, but we have to discuss with China on a number of points. We can't solve the big problems of the world without China. We have to talk to China. We have to engage, to use an English term, in all those areas where we need to, but engage in a way that stays clear-headed, bearing in mind that of the three prongs, the three dimensions we've talked about for a lot of time, right now competition is probably the most salient. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas Kuczka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Hi, Representative, when you presented your proposal for an EU military assistance or training mission in late August, the support from member states was not very strong. Many wondered what the added value would be. Now, in the meantime, uh, something must have happened that changed the mind of member states, because this presumably is one of the biggest or the biggest training missions. Can you please explain what happened politically between the end of August and now, the decision you've taken today? And more concretely, um, the 15,000 soldiers that you mentioned, do you expect them to be trained by, let's say, early next year or over the course of two years? Thank you. No puedo darle el well, I can't give you a strict chronology of how the 15,000 will pan out. 15,000 in one bunch, no, it's going to be one squad after another. The rhythm, the way, the means and progress will depend on how the program runs and our activities within that program. I hope that by the middle of November, though, less than a month from now, we will have got the mission up and running. The 15,000 won't be all there at the same time on week one. That's not the aim. And they're not going to be trained in a week. But the idea is a minimum length of two years, a minimum length of two years for the mission overall, depends on how the war pans out and the, the way it, uh, it develops. But I agree with you about the uh, initial reticence that existed, but it was relatively quickly overcome. At uh, the start of the summer, the informal defense council, when this idea was first first mooted, there were a lot of questions around the table, and these doubts were, ex were dis uh, 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 answered, discussed, understanding came, the understanding that synergies coming from acting together was better than doing things in dispersed order, and then unfortunately as well, the increase in Russian attacks, the manner of those attacks that unfortunately had the effect, uh, or those unfortunate events had the effect of strengthening the resolve to go forward, amongst others. Mr. Borel, my name is Kasr Naji. I'm from the BBC Persian Television in London. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask you about the sanctions announced today against Iran. Many Iranians that I talk to ask me, what are the points, the point of these sanctions? The people that you have sanctioned, they never come to Europe. They don't have assets in Europe. They, they uh, basically, these um, sanctions have no impact on them or on the freedom of the Iranians on the streets uh, in the cities of Iran. So the point is, why, why these sanctions? Why not something that actually matters uh, to uh, people of Iran? Uh, just outside here this morning, there was a demonstration just outside your conference, and there was a demonstration calling for uh, sanctions against uh, Iran's Revolutionary Guards, for example. There are opposition figures who are asking for um, uh, lowering the level of diplomatic relations with Iran, throwing out ambassadors, even closing down the embassies. Um, all sorts of measures that could be taken that are not taken, and these symbolic um, sanctions are hardly going to get anywhere. Is it because you still hope for reaching some kind of a deal with the, uh, on the G GCPOA front, or what is it? Thank you. 
Estas son las sanciones personales. Well, these are personal sanctions, the type of initial sanctions, personal sanctions that the EU tends to take, impeding access to our territory, etc., etc., assets, and so on. Targeted at some persons, not all, some more than others within the list, but I assure you that the government of Iran will not like this. It is going to matter to the government because of the political impact, because the effect of the message is what it is, and it will be clearly understood as such. It will certainly not change the lives of uh, Iranians uh, overnight, uh, let alone the lives of the protesters against the regime, but it's part of the political process. It's not the last such decision we will take, probably, but it is how we start a process of manifest disapproval in circumstances like the ones we are seeing in Iran. Hello. Thank you for, for the question. Um, Well, if the evidence, um, the, the evidence gathering process uh, is successful and, and you are satisfied that Iran is, is indeed uh, sending uh, drones to Russia, um, you said that in that case uh, the EU will act. So I would uh, like to ask you if uh, there is enough, um, do you think there is enough support from uh, um, uh, the member states in that and especially uh, doesn't that give also a message that if a third party is clearly supplying arms to Russia, in this case Iran, then maybe uh, the European states can step up and also support different kind of arms to Ukraine? Do you, do you see that that debate could happen at some point? Thanks. Francamente, creo que en este tema Frankly, on this, member states have already shown great unity, very consistent uh, shared concern and uni unified response. They've all asked for all the evidence to be collected, everything that's necessary to be done in a comprehensive way, irrefutable way, for, and this is a major factor in determining their attitude. Once all the evidence is available, and there is a lot already. I don't think there will be any problem in future steps by member states. <coughs> we are not going to take 100 questions. No, no that's not. It's over. Um, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, High